Do you know the pain of dropping your phone on the floor as a fat person? Because you, you drop your phone on the floor, you bend down right now, you pick it up. Fat people, if you ever see a fat person dropping their phone on the floor in the mall, just take some time to look at them. <laughs> wow. And, and try to investigate the internal embarrassment that, that they're, they're going through. It's like, because you to pick up that phone now, now you must have a conversation with yourself, or this phone do I really, really... Hey family, a quick one. Over 87% of you are consuming this content every single week but are not subscribed. That means you are enjoying the growth conversations but you are not liking, you are not subscribing and you are not sharing it with others. So please, I plead with you, please subscribe so that you can share the love, you can share the growth and you can share this wonderful platform and wonderful safe space with others as well. Enjoy the episode. Sure, my Brad. Are you good? The best. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. Best. Um, one of the things that I love um, starting the show with is in order to understand why a person does what they do, I, I, I like to interrogate why, what is your why? Um, why do you think you are who you are and have chosen the path that you've chosen? There has to be a holistic reason that has made you choose, Wuti. This is so my deep why. When... Yeah, bo- no, we're not deep. You are deep. <laughs> you are deep. Let's go deep. Why? Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, why? Why? Why make people laugh? Sure. Because I, I'm great at it. Mm, 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 mm. I'm amazing at making people laugh, and I think. Apart from being amazing, I'm, I'm grateful that I can do it. Okay. So my why has to do with a lot of gratitude. Because even at times when you don't want to do it, you always remind yourself that you could have not have the ability that you do have to do it. So go do it. Does the gratitude come from a place of, Uguzi, I've got a talent that was given unto me and it's not something that is given to many people. Very and few. Very few have that talent, right? Yeah. And I'm able to exploit it to a level that one, it makes people, other people happy. Yeah. And two, it gives me a sustainable living. What's sustainable? You're talking about money. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> we see the new cars. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it, it, it has to do with that. It's, it's, it's the happiness behind it and it's the sustainability behind it. Uh, but also it's the gratitude behind it, always knowing that I'm blessed to to be able to do this. I could have I could have been doing anything else. I could have been having a full time job, uh, being irritated by a manager all the time, I was looking for things that I don't want to provide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm able to do things in my own way and how I like it. Many people though, other comedians have gone onto platforms and spoken about how uh making other people happy masks their own unhappiness um do you think there's an overwhelming unhappiness within the comedians industry maybe not per se for yourself oh yes to be a comedian you have to have depression wow <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the main things yeah. if you're going to be funny you have to have some level of depression inside of you you can't just be happy and then <laughs> be funny it's but how do the two worlds meet? Because depres- depression is the complete opposite of being happy. How, how do you source happiness when you yourself don't believe you are in a good place? I, I don't know. It's how it is. Um, what is that guy's name? Robin Williams had yeah. statements about how the most happy people are usually the most unhappiest mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. their own corners. And I think that's what it has. It has to do with the fact that you do not want the next person to feel what you're feeling. Okay. And because you have this gift and this talent to be able to make them laugh, mm-hmm. you try your best to do that, even though you might be going through your own thing. And that is why even if you listen to the funniest jokes in the world, you can hear that these jokes could come from a place of hurt. Mm-hmm. If you take the funniest jokes that you've ever heard and, 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 and listen to them without laughing or give them to a boring person, and tell a boring person, please say what this person has said, word for word. Mm-hmm. And you listen to it. 
it's probably one of the most heartbreaking things you can ever, ever listen to. But the comedian has the ability to put in a, a satire, funny element to that heartbreaking story. A comedian story. has the ability to turn it around. Yeah, yeah, the comedian, yeah. I think a, any comedian has the, has this gift of being able to be in a sad situation and see something funny and be like, that is dead. I know we said, but that right there is funny. Is it healthy, though, to operate from a place of depression and not address the depression while remaining funny? Look, I, I think everybody has a duty to address their own depression. I'm not saying that they are depressed or whatever. I'm saying that they have had to have had it somewhere, okay. somewhere okay. somehow. Maybe okay. they have healed or, yeah, or maybe yeah. whatever. But, but at somewhere some point, in the journey. At some point, yeah. it was just there. Yeah. Even the art itself is depressing in itself. Because you can go on a dry spell. You can... You can be performing for about three weeks and nobody laughs in the three weeks. Do you know how depressing that is? <laughs> Com- comedy, comedy is a is an instant thing. It's, it's is, it a, is it a thing? Uh, if nobody instant. laughs, it, it hurts. Big time, big time. This is like imagine if Young Stunner had to release an album today. Yeah, he would only be sad after two months when he goes on to reports to see that only five listeners. people listened. Yeah, you understand? yeah, yeah. Only then. It would hit him that sure. maybe I suck. But there's a comedian now it, on stage. On stage. Usati, why does the chick cross the road? And then... And you're like, hey, maybe I suck. It's, it's now. You're dealing with the now thing. I hear the, you. You deal with the rejection immediately. It's not a later thing. And then two seconds later, you have to move on. And, and sometimes it's difficult to move on. Yeah. It's just one of those nights where yeah. nobody's laughing. Now you must deal with this thing from... When you're done performing, until you can perform again. And what happens when you perform again and they still don't laugh? And now it's been three weeks, as you're saying. Now it's been three weeks and people haven't been laughing. But you can't give up because you believe that there's something funny in there. But every night when you're driving home, you're thinking about, Yo, what can I add to my CV to make it uh, mm, mm, look? Mm. Maybe I should add computer literacy. <laughs> you know, but that's, And that's the thing about... Uh, comedy and how it can instantly break you down. So sure. it's 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 a very it's a very humble art. That's why it's very few comedians can come and say I'm the best comedian, I'm the funniest comedian, I'm the most successful comedian because it's it, it's a very humble art because it will deal with you now. Mm-hmm. You can come on a podcast and say I'm one of the funniest comedians in the country, and then next week perform at Empress Palace and yeah. three thousand people. And bomb. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. people are on go back to their podcast and be like, Ah yeah, I watched this guy last week. Guy. Don't listen to him. Yeah, yeah. It's cap. Yeah. It's all cap. It's there's all not, cap. Yeah. Ah, there's nothing funny. And then people can support him be like, Ah, I watched him too. Ah yeah. I and was like, there at that show. And that is why he played us. Ah, they run that they don't fool us at the podcast. He was just talking because there was nobody there yeah. who could pigisa him. But we've seen him. Yeah. There's nothing to him. He should go find a full time job. Does the art often feel like a burden then? No, not often, no. You you somehow you you somehow pass that threshold of of letting it depress you, because you, you get to a point where you do understand that I will bomb, uh, I won't always be funny. I will try to always be funny. I will work hard to always be funny. But at some point, I will bomb. And when I bomb, I didn't bomb because I'm not funny. I'm bombed because it was one of those nights. I bombed because maybe I was trying something new out. And I didn't write it as well as I thought, but I have an opportunity to go home and write better and, and, and do better when I come back. You're saying writing something new. So are you telling me that at dif- like when you go to different gigs, there's like this little box that you have and you repeat jokes all the time? Is that what comedians do? Yeah, it's our, it's our jokes. Okay. It's, our it's your jokes. intellectual property. First of all, that's what you, people must understand. Because there's this whole big notion, especially in South Africa, of... Hey, this one is repeating. Yo, we've been yo, we've been hearing his mm, joke. Mm. Yo, we've been hearing his joke about him being fat. We are tired. But what they don't understand is, and as much as you are trying to be tired, one, it is my joke, and two, in the bigger scheme of things, you hearing me, you you are only maybe one percent of the population that I'm trying to target. I hear you. Because you've heard me in an audience of, say, a thousand people. Absolutely. Even though it's a big show. Less than a thousand. That, less than a percent, even. That you thousand. understand? You try to target the world. I'm trying to target the world. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the joke that is going to get me to the world. And yes, you might be angry that I'm hearing it for the third time, but understand it's my joke 
and I it's your hit to, single it's my hit single i'm yeah. going to perform it and i'm going to one day record it and hopefully it's going to go on netflix where the entire world can watch absolutely and even after netflix if i'm still feeling like i want to tell this joke i will tell this joke because it is mine in an arena in Dubai. Ah, my yeah, man, my man, uh, yeah. You know, Casper your vest till today. Yeah. I'm Shemeleza. Uh, Absolutely. Dog, and nobody will complain. I get that, bro. I get that. It's his. And allow us allow us as well. Yes, there is the pressure that we must write. And I will not dispute that. There is the pressure that we must have new material and everything. But that new material will not happen on your time. It'll happen at my time because I need to now I need to process my my material. I need to be able to be like, okay, it's fine. I can let go and introduce this. I, I, I like that you say that because I had Big Star Johnson on that couch and he spoke about after he's taken, he took a four to five year hiatus mm. um, because he, wasn't, he was going through mental health issues and just his career wasn't where he wanted it to be. But he said, even in that hiatus, fans still reach out and say, we want new music, we want new music, we want new music. So as you're saying, just juxtaposing it to what you're saying about the, the, the new material and the writing, is that you can't force a creative to keep on giving new things all the time. Yeah. Because if it, it, it stops being authentic. Now yeah. it's writing for the sake of writing. Now it's writing under pressure. And when you write under pressure, you will, you will lose the thing that you loved about that person. Yeah, yeah. And then a year from now, you will say, I used to support this guy when he used to rap about loving his mother. But now because he raps about porn, I hate <laughs> him. And you're the one who pushed him to rap about porn because when he wrote about his mother, it was an entire process. He had to go... First of all, he had to go into the hurt yeah. of his upbringing. Tap into it. You know, tap into it and accept it. And then accept it and then write it, and then he wrote it in a heartbreaking form huh. that he could not release. Then he had to find a way to turn this heartbreak into sort of a, a happy story. Then only he could go into studio and record. Now, we never asked this person, how long did that entire thing that process. take you? Yeah. But now you forced him. And because people, they fold to fans, they fold to the sure. audience, now they'll be like, okay, cool, you want new music? I'll give you new music. What can I write? Have you ever folded to your fans? Uh -huh, I don't fold. I don't fold to. I don't fold to fans. I don't fold to bullies. I don't fold to anyone. I do what I do. I listen to what people say. I listen to you. I but you know we need one two three. I listen to you and then I think about it. And I'm like maybe they right, or I can easily say no, they're not right. Let me let me continue what I'm doing. So, so there is space as a creative to listen and hear within reason because it's not every it's, important. it's not every piece of advice that you must ignore and block out it's important i know people always say no just ignore the haters the, the comments that it's noise ignore the noise but as people we must able to discern not everything is noise out of 100 comments there could be two that are making a valid point so you reflect and be like hmm maybe if i do change this small little thing then then i'll improve yeah it's very important to listen to those people like here, not listen here, and then decide what you listening to, what you are taking in. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. E everything, even even the haters. You know, sometimes it's the haters that can give you your greatest stuff. I will tell you. I'll make an example on myself on this platform. I had haters consistently every week. Something I didn't realize because I'm not a, a sound engineer person. It's my team who does that. Yeah. And I had people whom I thought were haters. Who was telling me that the sound is bad, the sound is bad, the sound is bad. Sure. Because I was listening to the, the sound on a different device yeah. that is more powerful. But the, the people consuming it have various devices. And because I listened to that eventually, and I'm like, wait, the sound was bad. Yeah. You know? I, I, my head is loud. I must ignore them. You know what I always tell people? I always tell people that the, the people who've driven me, my greatest jokes, are those who thought they insulting me the hardest. Mm. And they and those people come in hard, especially on your know, Facebook. Oh, those people come hard for, all oh, those people come hard for me. You can while I'm reading you, like you're this person really tapped into their witchcraft. <laughs> deep, deep, deep. I'm like, ah, oh, but this is a dope thing to say, even though it's rude, very dope. Let me take this and put it on stage, and then I will get on stage and I'll say exactly what they said in my own context, and then I'll get a standing ovation, and I'm like, this thing is gonna make me so much money. So I think. As an artist and as anybody who is servicing people, mm. it's important that in as much as you think you know what you're doing, listen to them. L listen to them and hear what they have to say and then it's up to you if you take it in or not. 
there's another intimate journey that you've taken us on online, um, which is something not not many people are willing to address and as and especially address it publicly. Uh, you've taken us on this new health journey that you're on. Sure. Why is health so much of a priority to you right now? What what realization did you have? Um, I I had the realization that I'm struggling to perform on stage, so I I had a gig where I was. No, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I got into a fight one night. Uh, we're coming from a gig, and then some guys kicked our car. Some guys were just in the streets and just kicked our car. Then immediately I jumped out to go try and deal with them. And when I was fighting with them, I realized that I only have four punches in this fight. And that's when I realized that the enemy is not this guy that I'm fighting with. The enemy is, is myself. Yeah. <laughs> because if this guy doesn't fall in the next three punches, I'm the one who's going to faint. Because I'm not doing well. And then when I was driving, I couldn't speak to my, uh, to my friend. Like for the entire 40 minutes drive. We didn't speak to each other. In the car, I was just... <laughs> <sighs> no, like, mm, ah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, this is not life. And then I realized that, hey, you know what? I get tired too too quickly. And I need to improve my fitness because now this is not only about the fight itself, but it's just about not being able to do a normal thing, like being on stage for 15 minutes without looking like I've been in the mines for eight hours. Jeez, only 15 minutes, bro, would, would exhaust you. Ah, you'd, cry, yo, you'd come out, and now fans want to take pictures with you. You're, you're tired, sweating, you're, you're sweating. tired. You look like, yo, you look like you've been in war. So that was what made me decide that I, I need to actually get fitter. And within, within that, then I eventually decided that, you know what, let me also try cut down some weight. Mm -hmm. I've never had issues with my weight. I've never... I've never had a problem with being fat. In fact, if you listen to me doing stand-up comedy, that is all I speak about. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. never, I never, I'd never ever had it's a problem. It's actually giving you content. <laughs> yes, a lot. I've never had a problem with it, but I did realize that I'm crossing a certain line that is not healthy for me to be crossing. And that's why I decided that, you know, let me just try cut down whatever I can cut down just to also be able to live longer if possible. Mentally, what does it do for you, though, to realize that I've taken a step for my health? That Does it make you feel better? Do you feel better right now? Like, yeah, I feel much better. Yeah. Oh, you, you, feel, you feel much better, you know? Being able to, to put on a gene that hasn't been able to go in for maybe five years, mm. and then it now fits, is, is a great feeling. It's a feeling of whatever I'm doing has progress, you know? You know, to be able to go into it an aeroplane and just fits in the seat belt without asking for an extender. Yeah, yeah. And as much as people are don't it doesn't affect people much because they use the normal seat belts. But to you it's a big thing and yeah, like, oh yeah. man, wow, okay, we're doing something right. So let's carry on. Let's do it. And also, I, I, I actually see, I actually see that because when you're in a plane, like a person who's my size, you'll be sitting there, and then somebody's calling the the the, the, the air host or the air hostess yeah. and asking for this extender, and it almost looks like the person is embarrassed to receive it. I've yeah. noticed, yeah, like when the when the when the air hostess is carrying this extender, now everybody wants to see yeah, pill extender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then where's those air, those air hostesses carrying that thing with pride? Yes. Like, <laughs> it's like the advertising. I'm about to go give someone a an extender. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct. Come on, Jalo. Now we're all looking at the app in the extender. Yeah, I'm like, oh, what's up? You know, the, the thing about also being big is you don't... The, when you can't do normal things, mm. it's embarrassing. Yeah. And even though nobody's looking, it's embarrassing. Do you know the pain of dropping your phone on the floor as a fat person? Because you, you drop your phone on the floor, you bend down right now, you pick it up. Fat people, if you ever see a fat person dropping their phone on the floor in the mall, just take some time to look at them. <laughs> wow. And, and try to investigate the internal embarrassment that, that they're, they're going through. Going through. Inside. Because to pick up that phone, now, now you must have a conversation with yourself. Or this phone, do I really, really, really do need, you need it? Do need it? Will insurance not pay me? <laughs> to go down and pick up that phone. Ah, it's something because a lot yeah, of things, yeah. a lot of things you can be bending down to pick up that phone and then your stomach is like, ah, uh ah. -uh. And then you roll over in front of people. No. Or your t-shirt goes up, your pants goes down. Now your cleavage in front of you. <laughs> ah, I'm afraid to. 
<laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, while he's still bending down to pick up your phone, there's this cramp that hits fat people right here, right here. Then people don't know this cramp. Only fat people can be like, I know that cramp. And you can't explain it to anyone. I've never had a cramp, yeah. <laughs> you and only another fat person will be like, eh, now we are bamba. Look at the tree right here, right? Like, see. And you can't stretch it out. Now you bend down, you can't go back up. And then only another fat person will be like, no, please, breathe, breathe. And then another thin person will be like, why is this fat person telling this other fat person to breathe? And like, no, it's, it's a fat thing. You never understand. How much of it is vanity, though? I can say for myself, right? I'm, I'm, I've always been small, yeah. but with age, um, I'm turning 30 this year. Sure. With age, I started realizing when my metabolism is slowing down. So if I continue eating a certain way, eh, I'm starting to not be chiseled in certain parts of sure. my body. Yeah. So out of vanity, I won't even lie, it was highly motivated by vanity more than health. I was like, nope. Minangizazi, I know myself as to be this perfect body person. Um, I want to stay perfect body. So I started taking health journey. Mm. On your side, has vanity influenced any way? You would know I want to be smaller. No. No, ne? No, never. Because like I said, I've, I've always, as far as I can remember, I've always been big. I think I was maybe small when I was a baby, but then uh, I've always been a big person. And I've always been able to navigate my life as a big person. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I didn't mind it at all. In fact, when I when I talked to the whole team behind the weight loss journey and they're like, what is your weight goal? Mm. Yo, guys, to be honest, I don't have. I only went to the gym to try to be fitter and now we're losing weight. I don't know. We'll see. And we're having fun. Gym yeah, actually becomes fun. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll, we'll see, we'll see, man. We'll see. Where, where do we end up? Maybe one day I'll decide, okay, I want to be thin or I'll be like, no, this is the size I want to be. I do not know. I'm not lying. Because to you. Tell people when they lose weight, they stop being funny or they stop being able to sing. Aren't you Ooh, scared? <laughs> I think about that a lot. Yes. <laughs> I think I, I really think about it a lot. And I always have to remind myself that I'm I'm not funny because of my jokes. I'm funny because I'm funny. But it is it is a very scary thought. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you 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 do think or real. What if I lose weight and I lose humor too? S- speaking of being funny, um I wanna go back to I wanna rather I wanna go to discovering that you're funny sure um many people singers discover that they can sing at church um some get told by an aunt so we'll you, I was a tula, when i go into idols um when did you discover that you were funny and who discovered that you're funny okay there's two parts to it there's being funny and there's being stage funny okay being funny i realized growing up that you've got humor that i've got humor yeah you know you can see it when you like, uh, just as a kid, you can see that, you no know, in the group, if somebody's going to make people laugh, it's going to be me. And I've always grew up with that. Being stage funny was, wasn't a thing. I used to MC. Okay. Yeah, so your, your 21st birthday parties, you know, your functions, just MC. I would do that a lot. I'd MC at church as well. And then one of my friends from back home started having uh, these, I can call them talent evenings, where there was poetry, comedy, and stuff like that. And then he called me and he was like, yo, Doug, can you come through and perform this side? I'm like, Master MC? He was like, no, come do stand-up comedy. I'm like, I'm fun. I don't know how to do stand-up comedy. Then he's like, oh, this is what stand-up comedy is. You, you set up, you build anticipation, and then a punchline. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, that's what we can call it. Come through. Then I went through, done five minutes. It was funny. I enjoyed it. Then I was like, okay, cool. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I can do this. And that just was it. And you were like, I'm running with this. Yeah. And how old were you then? I was, uh, what was it? 21, 22? Jeez, bro, that's that's a young age to be affirmed that I can do this. Yeah, a lot a of people age. are not that affirmed. It was a scary age, but I I took it because I, I believed in it. And I still do believe in it. Yeah. Right now, you're at a place where you've, you've got a lot of commercial success that is attached to, 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 to being funny. Sure. And being who you are, right? As I'm saying, there's nice cars. What am I? <laughs> <laughs> the money's rolling in. But did you ever think you can commercialize it when you were realizing that you could at stand up back then? Um. No, back then, the idea of commercializing it was more... How can I say tricky and dangerous mm-hmm. and, and difficult, not dangerous, difficult because the pre COVID there was a right to passage with becoming famous. Explain. Uh, there were 
You had okay, to, they had to I perform at certain places. Yeah, get yeah. approval from certain people. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't have a podcast if McG didn't say yes. You understand? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with comedy, it was the yeah. same thing that you couldn't, you couldn't get uh, an Mnet special. I hear you. If certain people didn't say, Abu Dilolo can do an Mnet special. Yeah. So becoming, be, becoming a brand in comedy was difficult then. Because you had to go with these people. And these people maybe had rules that you don't necessarily... Subscribe to. Exactly. Uh, but now, everything became easier after COVID because COVID put us in a place where everybody was chilling at home and the internet was for everybody. Uh -huh. And it, it took... It no took, barrier to entries no, anymore. It took, it took the mainstream idea away and then internet now became mainstream. And that is why now everybody can operate how they want to yes yes and that is why now anybody can become successful and you can't do anything about it you're chilling at home one day you an mc thinking you're doing great and then jiggy jiggy now here's komoda mm. and as much as you want to get angry look at komoda and be like but this guy has zero talent there's nothing you can do about it and it's gonna frustrate you more knowing more you only charge 10k and komoda charges 90k and it makes you angry. He charges 90k. Yeah, he does. Easy. <laughs> to come and do nothing. Nothing. He comes and does nothing. And it will frustrate you as somebody who's in the same field. Rather, he comes and he bees himself, the himself that in his whole life has been judged. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. You, you put it perfectly. Yeah. And to you, this is nothing. Yeah. Looking like Amarale Inex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's just doing himself and he's being himself and he's killing it and he's really successful and he's really good. I went to a gig cut December where Skomota was in the same place and I realized that these people are not worried about my presence here. Huh. They don't care about my presence. Like they're just looking around waiting for Skomota to do something. They, these people are literally with their phones like this. For the, waiting the for a is, TikTok the, moment. The man is sitting down. Man is sitting down in his own world because also you must remember Roscomota is not necessarily over its hundred percent. So sometimes he zones out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure that the cable doesn't seem to touch the paraffin proper. Then he'll zone out for thirty minutes. But these people are still here waiting for him. Thirty minutes can I get cola? The moment he zones back, <laughs> yeah. it's flashlights, Baba. But it's that time he's just going to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? And this is how famous this bro is. And and you you want to get angry because you thought, wow, I'm what? I'm probably like, ah, you know what? This is how, this is how the life is now that anybody, anybody can make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's why um, now it's easier to be, to be a stand-up com comedian and decide that, okay, I can make it in this mainstream world or not. It's up to you, basically. Would you say you have a desire to exist in the mainstream or you're happy existing on the sidelines of mainstream? I have a desire to have money. I hear you. And if I can have money without mainstream, I'll be, I'll be happy. Okay. You know why? As, in, in as much as anybody can make it into mainstream, once you're in mainstream... You're bound. And you have to subscribe to their rules. And you have to subscribe to what they're doing. So... For example, let, let me give you another example, Kasko Mota. Kasko Mota is famous now. They're taking a video of him every single second. And now there's a video of him digging his nose. Something that to him has been a normal thing in his entire life. I hear you. And now somebody has to coach him or eyes, Kasko Mota. Hey, stop digging. Stop digging your nose. I want to know. There's a video. There's a video of you digging your nose. And then now, now he needs to go back. Or oh, everywhere he goes, he could just be going to buy bread. And somebody be like, do the Skomota dance. You understand? Go shop right. <laughs> All he wanted was bread. Or oh, now, the thing about mainstream is also that you can't just go to the shop in slippers and a t-shirt and jay. Because now you need to take selfies everywhere. Now your image is important as well. Your appearance is important. So mainstream in itself is another headache that I don't think many people think about beforehand because we all want to rush for the success but we're not ready for the headache Oof, that's power bro. that comes with this entire thing we because it's a system it. you know understand well oiled it's well -oiled hundreds system. of years exactly and one thing about becoming mainstream is even your opinion huh. 
has value and weight in this world. Now you must be careful of the things you say. You just can't come on a podcast. And, and that's why many people will come to a podcast and have fun. And then they'll trend on Twitter. Mm-hmm. There was somebody who was trending, uh, some lady who was saying something about if white people win elections, they'll bring back apartheid. And then to her, there was just... Uh, she was just on a podcast she's having a, a chat. Podcast. Yeah. Ah, and the next thing, she's trending for being stupid. People are calling her out. They're like, yo, how stupid can you be? What, what? Others are taking her opinion. They're like, yo, what if this thing really happens? Uh, and that's the boring part about mainstream. that you There's know, consequences. There's consequences. Yeah. It's that thing of, you know, that saying, I think it's a Bible saying that to him, much is given. Much is required. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the problem about being mainstream. And that is why I say that if I can have the money and not the mainstream, I'd be happy. I, I hear you because nowadays there are people who have never touched mainstream, but they are making sometimes even more money than people who are in mainstream. And nobody's waiting for them for an opinion. Nobody's waiting for them for an opinion. Nobody cares what they're saying. Nobody cares what they're saying. They're, they're authentic. Exactly. Cyan Poji. Ah! Perfect. You know? Perfect. Numbers like crazy. Perfect hey, example. She coughs numbers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Perfect example. She's just, she's just doing whatever it is that she wants. Yeah. But also at the same time is now it's our responsibility to make sure that our kids stay away from whatever she's giving because she has influence. Are you saying that digital is also creating huge room because there's no rules in digital? There's huge, huge room for things that are destructive and they are spreading. Yes. Yes. Because that is, unfortunately, that is the, the downside to everybody being able to have access. Is that when we can't filter who can be in or who can be out. Mm, mm, so mm. if everybody's in, then you must know not everybody has pure intentions. Not everybody cares about the, mm. their reputation. They don't care about this dimasabo. And that is why people can now decide that, you know what, for the sake of likes, I'm going to go live and be naked. You? You get. For, uh, I don't, I was on my Instagram and then I came across a video of some girl and it looked as if they're just making a, a TikTok video. She was in a room with four guys mm-hmm. and it looked like they're just making a, some funny TikTok video. And then I realized when I was scrolling through the comments that she's actually selling an OnlyFans video. And I'm like, it is so easy to get con- consumed by these things. Yeah, yeah. And there's no filter to these things. And that's where the danger comes in. That unfortunately, we're going to be raising kids who have access to things that they shouldn't have access to. Yeah, yeah. And that is why even on Twitter, you can see that there are 16-year-olds who who are trending for things that they shouldn't be doing. Of course. And they've been spoken about for weeks on end. Weeks on end. Getting yeah. bad lists. Saying they've quit school, Bona. School is a waste of time. Don't you? And there's nobody there to to be able to put them back in line. In fact, they had to take Usayan, who's also one of them, <laughs> to be like, ah, 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 whoa, I, understand, I understand we all live in the lives we want to live. Empower, go back to school. Yeah, you yeah. get. And that's the that's the boring parts about all of this is that there's no there's no control. Unfortunately, will we live one day in 10, 15 years time to regret how much freedom we gave the young kids nowadays and the things we were allowing on the Internet, especially those of us who are older? Yes, we will. Uh, We will regret simple things like elections. As young people, we don't put enough uh, Uh, importance on elections. Yes, yes. We will regret that we've given that power away. Yeah. And. And our kids are dancing on the internet instead of voting. Yeah. That nobody's registering to vote. Yeah. Nobody knows why they should register to vote. Those conversations are not taking place. You go right now on Twitter and be like, have you registered to vote? You'll maybe get five people who comment. But go on Twitter right now and ask, what is your favorite sexual position? <laughs> you, you understand? Now we're living in such a world where... Or ask if... Uh... If if you are if you if you have to fetch your girlfriend and your mother who sits in the front seat. Ah, Mamela. <laughs> Mamela, do you want numbers? Do you want numbers? Ask those questions. <laughs> Ask those questions and then you will see the world that we live. I'm not saying that we need to be serious all the time, but we also need to be able to say, guys, there's a time for everything. And there's a time where we need to be serious because we don't see 
we don't we don't see the things that affect us. For example, why do young people need to vote? We need to vote because young girls think the only way they can make money huh? is through sex. Huh? And in as much as yes, there is an avenue to make money, and we cannot dispute that. It's an avenue to make money, yes, but it is not the only avenue. You do not have to walk down that road if you don't want to. There is so much abuse down that road. There is so much hurt down that road. But we don't speak about how it's because black females in corporate earn much less than anybody else in their positions. Mm -hmm. And if because we don't speak about that, we don't realize that this is the reason why we need to vote. We need to vote so that we can say that we want our fellow sisters to start earning as much as men, to start having, being in a world where they can be as competitive as the men. And before even men, we need black sisters to even get to a point where they can earn as much as white men in the corporate space. And that is why young people need to come together and we need to be like, okay, guys, you know, we need to be personal about this thing. Because if you want your podcast to keep going, people need to be able to afford Wi-Fi. People need to be able to afford devices where your podcast doesn't jam mm, after mm. 15 minutes. Yeah. And the only way they can afford that is if they have, they have good jobs. Yeah. And they have good jobs. So you, how do you get into the whole thing? You get into the whole thing because you need the people who follow you to have money. As a comedian, my, I charge 200 grand for my shows. I need the people who be like, Abuti Lolo, you are funny, you to support you, to be able to have 200 grand. Do you know how boring it is when you bump into somebody that says, yo, I saw you last week on SABC 1 on the repeat of Daily Tatter, then you're like, ah, this person watched me at 10 o'clock in the morning. Huh? This person is never coming to my show. Yeah. They are unemployed. <laughs> Do you know how hurtful that is? Because you are glad you have a fan. But, but that's also, where it ends. You also appreciate that, hey, this fan yeah. will never, it's can't not, currently afford my 200 grand. It's not a, monitors, a, a fan that can be monetized. monetized. Exactly. Yeah. And that is why... As young people, we are heading down a destructive path if we don't have such conversations of how do we come in and make sure that there's enough money to sustain these things that we're doing, that there's enough money to sustain podcasts, to sustain entertainment, to sustain uh, everything, basically. Yeah, yeah. You want to drop T-shirts today and you want to T-shirts to sell for a thousand rands. How do we build a world where... People are no longer complaining about it. It's a thousand. It's a thousand. Yeah. How do we build such? We want to have events. We want to have festivals. How do we build a world where we say that our festivals, general entry tickets are 400 rand mm -hmm. and people won't complain because they can afford that 400 rand. Because people are complaining about prices, not because they are complaining about prices, but because when you charge them 300 rand right now, that 300 rand is maybe 10% of the entire salary. Sure. And we're asking them to spend 20% on one day. Well, it's 100% because it's the 350 they get from government because they're unemployed. You get. Yeah. And then it's a, you've taken the entire salary for one, mm -hmm. for one yeah. event. Yeah. So how do we as young people say that this is not the world we want to live in? I mean, this is a start that we're having these conversations, but we can have these conversations here as men. But the very same black woman looks up to a 35-year-old woman who just bought a Porsche in October and just unveiled a Bentley a few days ago. So it's like we're fighting a losing battle as men if we're trying. Some of us who are good men, who yeah. are saying women must be independent, they must have good jobs, they must be paid fairly, they must be respected. But the, the, other, the others know that there's other ways to it. And they look up to women on the internet who've got 1 million followers, 500,000 followers, and those women will unbox sports cars every six months. Uh, how... Are we are, are we fighting a battle that like also what's going on? Also remember is that people are watching from a, pov a poverty point of view. Uh -huh. So the reason why you you look up to somebody who's unwrapped a Bentley this week or a Porsche this week, you're looking at them from poverty, and many people are looking from you. I would really really like that, mm. and that is why my encouragement is that we if we can change the dynamics where people start to work, then there'll be a paradigm shift in how we think and how we view things. Sure. There'll be many more people who'll realize that I'm happier with my nine to five and the salary that I'm earning to be able to do the things that I want to do and live this happy life. Because then they'll also start, those people will then start to come out and expose the amount of abuse that they go through. I hear you. Because now they have their own. Yes. And 
also have conversations with these people who these slay queens who unbox yeah <laughs> have have conversations with them and have honest conversations with them and tap into what did you have to go through yeah and if they're real they will tell you because you must understand that men with money many of them who buy women are not necessarily nice men and they're not necessarily gentlemen and once that starts correct and once all of that starts to come out more girls will see that I this is not the life I want to live if a man can be able to spit on me in the middle of the night then I I don't want that so they'll also there also needs to start being the conversation of ladies how much abuse did you go through for this Porsche huh? How, how much hurt did you go through for this weave, for this handbag? What did you have to do? How did you have to struggle? And once they start telling you how did they have to struggle, and you can collect all that and show it to the other young girls, then they can decide, hey, do I really want this or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you deal with pain? Mm-hmm. Music? I listen to a bunch of music and then yeah. perform. Yeah. I think also performing performing for me is very therapeutic. Okay. Yeah, so I think I go perform and then I become fine. I don't have a set. I don't have this big thing of saying this is how I deal with pain. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I can't help you out there. A lot of people pray about your have a certain, oh, yes, person, a certain person that they speak to, perhaps good friends, a partner. Um, and you're saying music fundamentally does that for you. Yeah, and performing. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What type of music? Oh, what you... the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Some piano, yes. There's very, there's very healing piano out there. Piano uh, is becoming my yeah, <laughs> Very spiritual. Um, yeah, some some piano, some some gospel, some jazz. Whatever I can listen to that is soothing, I, I go for it. Mm. I go for it. Do you think you found someone in the industry? Uh, maybe you'll want to share their name or not, uh, or, or, or but maybe you'll just want to describe what they've done for you. Because I find that a lot of people in this industry, in Joburg, believe that there's a lot of fakeness. People who want to be attached to you because they want to gain from you or they want to suck you dry. Mm. Have you found somebody in the industry where you're like, yo, this is my boy. I can trust them. Yeah, my friends. Um, Lisheza, Ezra, yeah. Skumba, do, do me stop nonsense. And pop pops, Titi Chumia. That's interesting because you speak about other comedians which and people perceive um, you guys to be competition. Not really, hey? I think comedy is one of the most... Uh, united, united industries, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't have much beef. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have a lot of drama. We have 20 small... <laughs> uh, we have told us more and, and everybody uh, else <laughs> <our child. laughs> so we are very we're very united and in as much as yes there are cliques it's not to say that the one clique is against the other clique just, I hear you let's click move together in whatever they're doing and then let's click move together in whatever they're doing and we have a good good brotherhood around that too. invite to a more Pella to a to your click, guys. So that oh, I mean, I don't have an issue with Tony <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't have an issue. I told us he's our pride. Yeah. <laughs> he's our pride. We love him. Dear Liso. Aputilolo, before we reach the end of our conversation, what are you working on currently? Currently, I'm working on shows. So I have a show called Aputilolo, I've Got Friends too, mm-hmm. which happens in Secunda a lot. And then I'm taking it to Whitbank, the rage on the 1st of June. And then I'm launching a comedy night here in Joburg as well at the Capitol Center called Laughs at the Capitol. So I'll be having yeah. comedy nights every uh, once a month. It's a premium stand-up comedy night. So it's going to feature some of the best comedians. And just a great night of fun. Yeah. But then I will post all that on my social media as time passes. And last but not least, what's that one thing in life that you believe in and you know for sure? That I'm amazing. Sure. <laughs> Without a doubt, yeah, I believe fully that I'm amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, interesting because some people will say I believe in change, or some people will say I believe that 
life will always have challenges. Oh, one thing you must know about me, I'm not one of those uh, what, celebs who always want to be deep and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you ask me what do I believe in, I'll tell you no. I you, you're that. absolutely... I'm not going to come here. I believe that the child of Africa, the inner me, <laughs> is to dispossess and encourage. I know, uh-uh, I can't. <laughs> Put it all over, brother. Thank you so much for your time. Thank man. you for having me. I really it's appreciate been, it's it. It's been good. And I wish you so much of the best in your career. And you and, too. And thank you for being so kind, man. You're such a good person. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Shout bro. out. Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.